So far, I think what you've said is that the vaccination program was going to exert a selective pressure on the virus that was going to cause a proliferation of mutants that would be that would have increased transmissibility. Yeah, a natural selection of mutants that can overcome that pressure. And we put the pressure on the spike protein, obviously, through the antibodies. And the spike protein is responsible for infectiousness. So we put pressure on the infectiousness of the virus. So we got natural selection of more infectious variants because the more infectious variants, obviously, could overcome the suboptimal pressure that we put on this characteristic of the virus. And the suboptimal pressure came, of course, from the fact, first of all, you put pressure by doing mass vaccination, and it is suboptimal because you do it during a pandemic. So people get already exposed to the virus before they have full-fledged immunity. We do it, in fact, with prophylactic vaccines that we use normally before we get exposed to the virus. When we travel to a foreign country where we know there is a disease we can protect against, you, you make sure that you get, you know, your full vaccination course completed before you get exposed. So we are not quarantining people that we vaccinate, right? right. They get their first shot. Yeah, their, their antibodies are immature. It takes time for them to mount the antibodies. But at the same time, the pandemic is ongoing and they can get exposed and a number of people get exposed while the immunity is still suboptimal. So the, the fact the mass vaccination is one important point and the other one the, do, uh, doing this during a pandemic is also very, very important in terms of you know exerting this suboptimal immune pressure. So I want to try to make that clear too. Mm. There's several errors here, as I see it. You've listed two of them here. Yeah. Um, one of them is the mass vaccination mm -hmm. program. And the other, well, actually, maybe you've got mass vaccination into a pandemic that's already raging, which yeah. means that there's several different places where we now guarantee evolution, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is that if you're just vaccinating everybody, you don't know who just caught the virus at the moment you vaccinate them, who's about to catch the virus. And so what that means is, you know, immunity takes time to develop. The immune system exactly. is learning something and it actually learns this through an amazing process. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite facts in all of biology is clonal selection, mm -hmm. right? Because we are a static target that lives for 80, 90 years, and we are up against pathogens that evolve on the scale of ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a population of cells that have been uh, adjusted by evolution to evolve in the same time scale. Mm -hmm. I find that just an utterly stunning fact, mm -hmm. right? So we have these cells, B and T cells being uh, the examples. So B cells make antibodies, T cells have something like antibodies that never leaves the cell. It's not a free floating protein. But the process of clonal selection requires cells to produce cells to produce cells, and each uh, generation of those cells gets closer to the formula, which means there's a period of time over which your immunity is developing. And the problem is that that period of time over which their immunity is developing may interface with a pathogen that is so widespread that you are likely to get it. And at the point that your immune system is exerting this selective pressure before you've developed immunity mm -hmm. is you have partial immunity. Yeah. Partial immunity is like a training program for the virus. Yeah. And that is really mm -hmm. the key error. Am I Absolutely, right? yeah. Uh, that is that is really the key the key error, and I'm always comparing this to you know. Uh, it's it just so amazing to me that everybody knows this from the field of antibiotics, and the only difference is we all know that viruses depend on living cells, yeah. and but if you have a bacterium, for example, and you have a medium with a suboptimal concentration of an antibiotic. The, the bacteria, they can replicate on themselves. So there is no, cha no, no need to change the medium. You have the uh, suboptimal concentration of the antibiotic and then you have the bacterium. And of course, you will have a selection of mutants that can overcome this, you know, this hostile environment. If now we have like viruses that, you know, depend on living cells and of course they will destroy the cell, so they will come out of the cell. So with that, 
also, you know, when they get transmitted, for example, to another individual, it is very, very important that you keep that suboptimal medium. The sub if, if the virus gets transmitted to somebody who is not vaccinated, this person is not going to present that hostile environment to the virus. And you got a natural selection in one person, but that advantage gets lost if it is transmitted to somebody who does not have the suboptimal immunity. But if you do the mass vaccination, it's like this sub suboptimal medium is going to be conserved just like with, you know, the bacterium, because it gets transmitted to somebody else, but it's the same situation, because this person also is presenting this suboptimal immunity. And if you have like, 60 70 percent of the population in that situation you will of course you will promote this natural selection and enrich of course this variant in the population so it is largely largely comparable to the situation with bacteria and suboptimal antibiotic just that the virus depends on a living cell and you know it, it needs to be transmitted to perpetuate its its cycle but every single time in a massively vaccinated population, it will encounter the same medium, just like the bacterium is proliferating in, under hostile conditions of suboptimal antibiotic concentration. Right. right. So, uh, in effect, what we did, which you're pointing out, is we ran an insanely large gain of function experiment that yeah. we didn't mean to run. We no, set up a selective environment yeah. and we basically said, here is the here here are the tools that we are going to deploy against you in a very weakened form and that gave the virus the ability to you know experiment in the way natural selection does and discover vulnerabilities of that system but your point is it goes from one person to another person and it keeps finding people with the suboptimal immunity exactly. so it keeps finding the same puzzle again and again and again and it's going to get good at it yeah. and there's another flaw here which arguably Maybe they didn't know. I, I suspect they did. But the fact that these vaccines are, well, and we probably should not be calling them vaccines. Robert Malone scolded me about that uh, earlier. And I believe, I believe he's right. I at, I at first wasn't convinced that the terminology mattered. But this is sufficiently novel that um, we should probably use a different term. But these inoculations do not produce sterilizing immunity. Yeah, that's the point, of course. So... Yeah. It, on the one hand, even if they did produce sterilizing immunity, you've got a problem if you're vaccinating into the face of the pandemic because people on the way to having full immunity are still a gain of function experiment effectively. Mm -hmm. But in this case, even people who have reached the final stage, haven't encountered the pathogen, have had two weeks or a month to develop mm -hmm. their immunity, are still a gain of function experiment because the immunity isn't sterilizing, mm -hmm. meaning they can catch the virus and they can transmit it. It's not shutting down the virus in their system. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, yeah. The problem is, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I, I, that, that's what I said. Don't use these vaccines that do not induce sterilizing okay. immunity during a pandemic and in the form of mass vaccination. So these three elements are, are absolutely, you know, critical.